A couple of years ago, right around this same time of year, we did a series of episodes on natural hazards. We covered volcanoes, lava, quicksand, wildfire, lightning, and avalanches. A respectable number of hazards likely to be encountered by your typical adventuring group out on a stroll through the countryside thanks to the random encounter tables. However, if you're from the Great Plains of the United States, or even parts of Southern Africa, bits of Europe, parts of Australia and New Zealand, and portions of India and South America, you'd be forgiven for thinking we overlooked you and your particular problems. Well, you're naturally occurring problems, at least. Geographically speaking, anything beyond that we can't help you with. In a surprise mid-introduction reveal, which if you bother to read the episode title is no surprise at all, we are, of course, talking about tornadoes, those big, spinny, funnel-shaped clouds of black, whirling debris and wind that bedevil certain parts of the world every year. I like to think we understand tornadoes pretty well, certainly well enough to give an advance alarm in the case of their imminent appearance on the local landscape. Just time to tie the cow down, make sure the house is securely on its foundations, and collect up our little dog, too. Admittedly, being able to warn people in advance of a tornado's arrival is certainly an improvement over the previous standard. There was a time not too long ago when we gave no warning at all. In fact, we couldn't even tell you a tornado was coming, even though we knew one was. To start, let's look at the Enigma tornado outbreak of 1884. It all started at about 11 o'clock in the morning in Louisville, Mississippi on February 19th. An F-2 tornado touched down and destroyed two homes in a mill. Pretty light damage considering what was about to happen over the course of the next 19 hours. Louisville got off lucky. At 11.30, another F-2 ran for 25 miles from Columbus, Mississippi to near Carrollton, Alabama, killing one person and destroying numerous farms and sharecropper cabins. At noon, another F-2 in Alabama traveled 20 miles and injured 16 people, causing a major fire in the town of Goodwater. It was followed by an F-4 in Birmingham that went 30 miles to Branchville, killing more than 13 people along the way. By the end of the day, Alabama would see three more tornadoes and another 30 deaths before the storms moved into Georgia. But the storms weren't done. Georgia was hit by 18 more tornadoes, killing 72. South Carolina had eight. North Carolina saw a further nine. By the end of it all, more than 50 tornadoes touched down across 10 states in 19 hours we think. See, the tornado count and death toll is hard to nail down exactly, both because this is 1884 and it's hard to officially count anything, and because a number of those who died may not have been in any official records of the residents of any particular area. Estimates are anywhere from 178 to a sadly speculative but all too likely 1,200 fatalities. Property damage at the time was estimated to be greater than 3 to 4 million 1884 dollars. But the damage was done in mostly very rural areas where houses and other buildings were very cheaply made. So the 10,000 buildings estimated to have been damaged may have been mostly low-quality constructions made cheaply. Other events associated with the Enigma outbreak included flash flooding along the Ohio River and blizzard conditions in parts of the eastern Midwest. And why did this all happen? Well, no one really understands why partly because of the nature of reporting and recording the storms and damage at the time. There was just no agreed-upon reporting agency, method, or standard. But also, partly because, even though tornadoes happened on a regular yearly basis, no one had really sat down and studied them. They were very poorly understood phenomena. In fact, it wasn't until 1882, two years before the Enigma tornado event, that U.S. Army Signal Corps Sergeant John P. Finley who had been interested in the study of tornadoes for years, was put in charge of studying tornadoes and developing a way to accurately forecast them in any sort of official capacity. And it was during the Enigma event that he worked out his 15 rules for forecasting a tornado, which would be published in 1888, the basics of which are still used today. This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. We've told a little lie in talking about the Enigma event. See, one of the problems with talking about tornadoes at all is the need to have some standardized way to compare one tornado to another. It's hard to look at only one of something and say anything useful about the whole class of objects that are that thing. 
you're really just describing the one example you have. So, someone had to come along and invent a way to look at two different tornadoes and make useful comparisons between them. That someone was Dr. Tetsuya Theodore Fujita of the University of Chicago, and the lie we told was about the rating of those Enigma tornadoes on Dr. Fujita's scale, the F scale of tornado ratings. Before we go any further, we have to clear up one oft-heard misconception. The F stands for Fujita, not Force. An F4 tornado is a Fujita scale 4 tornado, not Force 4. Anyway, prior to 1971, the Fujita scale didn't exist, and so wasn't around to be applied to tornadoes that happened nearly 90 years prior. The F ratings of the Enigma tornadoes are just a guess, based on what information was available to later researchers who went back to add ratings to all the significant tornadoes from the 1880s onward. Which was okay, because the Fujita scale itself was just a slightly more educated guess as to how tornadoes should be rated based on what criteria. But to understand how it works and what it means, we have to back up a bit and talk about two other scales first. The Fujita scale was designed to bridge the gap between two other important scales, the first of which comes from Irish hydrographer Francis Beaufort. Prior to the 1830s, ship captains would put to sea and dutifully record observations about the sea, the weather, the crew, and the ship as they had done for centuries prior. These would be used over the years by various people to figure out ocean currents, weather patterns at different times of year, and to generally improve everyone's understanding of how things worked and when it was most favorable to travel across the ocean from point A to point B with the least amount of trouble and the most speed. Unfortunately, these observations, especially about the weather, were written down with very little in the way of standard notation. Often conditions that might seem to be a light breeze to one captain, for instance, might be called a dead calm by another thanks to differences in ship and sail design and the general outlook of the captain and crew. Storms that blew up could be described in any number of ways depending on who was doing the describing, and it all made for a mass of information that was confusing and jumbled and no good to anyone trying to research things and make sense of it all. Something had to be done, so something could be done. Beaufort came along and standardized wind speed information, but rather than relate it to the actual speed of the wind as measured, he based it on easily observable conditions that could then be related to the speed of winds that were capable of creating those conditions. The condition being observed was the state of the sail on a frigate at sea, the frigate being the main class of vessel in use by the Royal Navy at that time. There were 13 classes of wind in the Beaufort Wind Force Scale, ranging from 0 to 12. 0 was calm, no wind. 1 was light air, or that which just enables a ship to steer. The scale then proceeds through gentle, moderate, fresh, and stiff breezes, judged by the rate of knots at which the ship was pushed, followed by moderate, fresh, strong, and whole gales, before wrapping up with storm, or that which would blow away any sail made in the usual way at 11, and hurricane at 12, which Beaufort explained simply by writing the word hurricane again, this time with an exclamation mark behind it. And so, the Beaufort scale was officially adopted in the 1830s, which was great until the advent of steam power to make ships sail around, as we discussed in our Oars to Steam episode. Around 1916, there was a distinct lack of sails on which to base the wind scale, and new methods of comparison had to be adopted. So the scale was revised to take into account the apparent state of the sea instead of the sails. A dead calm sea was still zero, and increasing numbers indicated increasing waves and better e-ticket rides. Well, at least until the exclamation point dropped. At the same time, the scale was also made to include wind speed on land for the first time, and the readings from anemometers those spinning half-ball devices you sometimes see measuring the wind, were incorporated as well. The other scale we have to consider, because it connects up to the Fujita scale as well, is the Mach scale, or rather, the Mach number. The Mach number represents the ratio of velocity to the speed of sound. And to be honest, it's a bit more complicated than that, but that will do for our purposes. The speed of sound varies based on a number of factors, not least of which is temperature, but again, for our purposes it's fine to assume an average value of 767 miles, or 1,235 kilometers per hour. Mach 1 is the speed of sound. That's where the Mach system begins. Every other Mach number says something about the relationship between the rate of travel and the speed of sound. 
So Mach 0.65 is 65% of the speed of sound, and Mach 5 is 5 times the speed of sound. Mach 23 is roughly 17,500 miles per hour, and was set by Captain Joe H. Engel while piloting the Space Shuttle Columbia back through Earth's atmosphere in November of 1981, making he, and presumably his crew, some of the fastest people ever recorded. It stands as one of several air and land speed milestones currently on record. So on one end, you have the Beaufort scale of wind speed, and on the other you have Mach speed numbers. And Dr. Fujita deliberately set his scale of tornado wind speed to run from one to the other. Up to hurricane speeds, you use the Beaufort scale. Past that, it's F numbers. F0 is about 40 to 72 miles per hour, followed by F1 to 4, and ending at F5 at roughly 318 miles per hour. Beyond that, you're talking about percentages of Mach speed, the speed of sound. 350 miles per hour, for instance, would be roughly Mach 0.45. But remember, we said Fujita was basically guessing when he set up the initial scale. The manner in which he guessed was pretty similar to the manner in which Beaufort estimated the increments on his scale. Fujita couldn't measure things directly at the time, so he too had to look at the effects of a tornado and do his best from there. The Fujita scale is set not by the actual wind speed of a tornado, but rather by the amount of damage and destruction done by a tornado after it has passed. Under Fujita's method, you couldn't know what the F number of a tornado was until after it had passed. So saying that an incoming still forming tornado was going to be an F2 or F3 is an even bigger guess than the guesses already involved in coming up with the scale in the first place. And those were some pretty big guesses. In the original Fujita scale, an F0 tornado was one which might topple a few chimneys, break a few branches, or uproot a few shallow tree roots. And you'll remember, Fujita reckoned those winds would be about 40 to 72 miles an hour. At the upper end, an F5 was a monster with winds ranging from 260 to 300 miles an hour or more. Houses were lifted from their foundations and scattered across the countryside. Cars become projectiles traveling hundreds of meters. Trees are debarked, and skyscrapers can be severely damaged and even knocked down. You don't mess around with winds that strong, and so Fujita gave them the best guess he could as to speed based on the damage those tornadoes were doing. And he was very nice about it all when someone showed him he'd been wrong. It turned out the winds don't have to be that fast to do that much damage. They can be much slower. So the enhanced Fujita scale was introduced and adopted in 2007. F0 is now a tornado of a modest 65 to 85 miles an hour that barely does any damage at all. A few tiles lifted off your roof, that sort of thing. And F5 was still a devastatingly dangerous tornado, but investigation and measurements showed that the damage they inflicted could happen at anything over 200 miles an hour. The descriptions of the damage remained the same, the speeds involved were reduced. A critical adjustment when it comes to warning people ahead of the storm track of the potential dangers. Most of us have a pretty rudimentary idea of what causes a tornado to happen in the first place. Sure, we have a vague idea that cold air meets warm air during a thunderstorm and it spins around or something until a funnel cloud happens and then it blows around for a while until someone goes to the distant land of Oz or sharks fall out of it. No one really understands them, so, like other science-ish things no one understands, they can do practically anything, including, but not limited to, cloning themselves, forming up into packs of roving tornadoes intent on hunting down humans, randomly popping out from behind buildings and shouting boo, and developing a malevolent presence with amazing dramatic timing. Occasionally, some cows get caught up in one and go for a ride, just to relieve the tension with a little comedy. Part of Finley's 15 rules of tornado prediction that he came up with during the Enigma incident involved setting the conditions under which tornadoes could occur. There had to be an area of atmospheric low pressure. Heat and moisture had to be moving from one place to another, and wind velocities had to be increasing in three or four specific quadrants among other things. Only if the majority of the 15 rule conditions could be met could a reliable prediction be made about the potential for a tornado. Finley would go on to make over 2,800 predictions about the weather, 
only 100 of which met the criteria for the forecast of a tornado. Overall, he claimed an accuracy of 95 to 98 percent. So good was he, it seems, that in 1887 the government stopped him predicting tornadoes on the grounds that such predictions would panic the general population and do more damage than the tornadoes themselves would if just allowed to happen. And to be clear here, it was specifically the use of the word tornado that was disallowed. You could say massive great big dangerous possibly deadly storm cell with intense winds likely to tear the top off your house and put your life at risk. You just couldn't say tornado. Nope, can't see any reason to panic there. The weatherman clearly didn't say tornado, so everything's fine. And that's the way things stayed for the better part of 40 years. In order to have a proper tornado, you have to have... There has to be... You need... Uh, well, look. Up front, we're going to talk a bit about how tornadoes happen. But it is important to remember that really, no one knows for sure. In the realm of science... Tornado genesis, as it is called, is still a really, really big guess. Mostly because, even with all the work being done and the information being gathered, tornadoes have still only been studied for the last 150 years, and only studied intensely to the level of finally being able to make inroads on understanding them for the last 50 years or so. Even Finley's rules were just conditions under which tornadoes could happen, not hard and fast rules. At its most basic, a tornado is a violently rotating column of air that touches both the ground and a group of cumulus clouds. A big thunderstorm blows into town, and part of it starts rotating in its upper reaches, forming what's called a mesocyclone, or intermediate cyclone, as hot air from Mexico collides with cold air from Canada. The whole of it spins first along the ground vertically, and then gains speed in the updraft caused by the rising hot air until the updraft stands it up into a column in the storm clouds. The storm is full of water vapor, which begins to condense and rain down. As the rain falls, it drags air down with it in a downdraft, which accelerates, pulling the upright mesocyclone towards the ground. Meanwhile, in another part of the storm, forces of convection move more warm air up, causing a vertical spin. As the mesocyclone passes below the cloud base, it takes on cold air from the downdraft, which runs into the warm air from the updraft, all of which forms into a rotating wall cloud. And the downdraft focuses the mesocyclone's base towards the ground, which begins sucking up air from the ground in a smaller and smaller area. And just like restricting the flow of a hose, this causes things to change pressure and pick up speed. Eventually, the difference in pressure and flow of air connect the mesocyclone to the ground, and a full-blown tornado occurs. At least that's what we currently think happens for some tornadoes, the biggest ones in particular. There's some disagreement about the actual manner of connection made with the ground, though. Some think the tornado forms entirely above the ground in the clouds, others think it occurs from the ground up, and still others think it happens from both ends and they meet somewhere in the middle. Obviously, more study is still needed. The second method of forming a tornado, which applies mostly to the weaker ones, is that a thundercloud produces a rotating tube of air along the ground, that gradually stands up in the updraft forming a tornado all on its own. These generally last only a few minutes, while the other kind, born of supercell storms, can last for miles and miles and upwards of 20 minutes or more doing massive amounts of destruction. It is often observed that tornadoes seem to occur or target one particular location more than any other. The trailer park or mobile home park. Wherever tornadoes happen, the news always shows a blown-out trailer park leveled by the force of the storm, not a mobile home left standing. And you'd be forgiven for believing this one. Even we, at one time, would have asked our friends, what is it about trailer parks that seems to attract tornadoes? Which is, of course, the wrong question. The proper question is, what is it about tornadoes that attracts reporters to trailer parks? Because that's all it is. Few things are less likely to survive the passage of a tornado than a big, blocky, flat-sided mobile structure laid out in a relatively flat area clustered together with other similar structures. Nothing looks more ruined than a mobile home scattered to the four winds, and few things make for a better background for a news report about how devastating the latest tornado was than a number of displaced people all in one spot. It only seems like tornadoes target mobile home parks because that's where all the reporters go when one hits. 
In truth, it just isn't so. Trailer and mobile home parks are no more likely to be hit by tornadoes than any other structure in the path of the storm. It has become easier to stay safe during a tornado, though. In March of 1925, the Tri-State Tornado touched down near Ellington, Missouri and traveled 219 miles through Illinois and into Indiana before dissipating. Along the way, it killed 695 people and injured 2,000 more. Subsequent study revealed that it met 9 of Finley's 15 rules, but because calling a tornado a tornado had been banned, the phenomena was not well studied. It was something of an academic dead end to go into the field. Therefore, no one knew enough to predict things in advance and warn people. It wasn't until 1942 when the country saw more than 130 tornadoes, 230 more deaths, and more than $7 million in damage when it was finally decided that maybe the public did need to know as early as possible that a tornado could happen after all, and that it needed to be called by the right name. Fortunately, World War II provided a new tool for tracking weather and keeping an eye on potentially dangerous storms. The advent of radar and the growing understanding of weather patterns and conditions likely to cause tornadoes meant that warning times gradually increased, giving people more and more time to seek shelter and safety. In 1972, two years before Dr. Fujita's scale entered regular usage, the U.S. Air Force published a document called Miller's Rules, created by Captain Robert Miller. The publication became the main reference for severe weather forecasting and laid down guidelines for weather analysis and the use of different symbology for marking severe storms and tornado conditions. It also explained forecasting parameters for tornadoes, large hail, and convective wind gusts. This document, combined with the use of radar, pushed tornado and severe storm forecasting forward, opening up the study of tornadoes and making it respectable again. Eventually, computer modeling would help increase the warning time even more, going from just a few minutes in 1974 to half an hour lead time in 1999 to today's play-by-play -play of storm cell formation and accounting of the conditions leading up to a tornado for several hours before one is even seen. Which means more people can get to safety sooner and fewer people die. And sure, we don't know everything about tornadoes yet, but it's getting better and the work started by Sergeant John P. Finley all those years ago is finally paying off. We can't know everything all at once during a crisis, but every bit we do learn makes it that much better and improves the odds of survival. Hello and thank you for listening to this episode of GM Word of the Week. We're glad you stopped by once again. If this is your first time listening, welcome. Make yourself at home. Kick off your shoes if you like. There's a lot to listen to. This episode is, as always, brought to you by our fine patrons on Patreon. Their support keeps the show ad-free and means you can get straight to listening without having to hear about meal kits, VPNs, or those terrible little Bluetooth earbuds first. Thank you for that, patrons. And if you, dear listener, are not yet a patron, please consider joining up for as little as a dollar. You can find out how by going to gmwordoftheweek.com and clicking the little yellow banner at the top of any page. It's easy, convenient, and gets you some nifty little rewards. Check it out. This episode was researched, written, and produced by Brian Casey, whose high school sports teams were called the Black Tornado. Music for this episode comes from the fine folks at Blue Dot Sessions. The world is full of people who will help you manufacture tornadoes in order to blow out a match.